All right. Welcome, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled today to be hosting Drs. Uh, Moshe Hoffman and Erez Yoeli um, for their new book, uh, Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. So very quickly, Moshe Hoffman is a uh, currently a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology, as well as a lecturer in Harvard's Department of Economics. And his research focuses on using game theory to decipher the motives that shape our behavior. Erez Yoeli is a research associate at MIT's Sloan School of Management, and he collaborates with governments, nonprofits, and companies to apply the lessons from game theory and research and behavioral science into altruism toward addressing real world challenges. With me today, uh, co-hosting is Nicola Rehani, who is the PI of the Social Evolution and Behavioral Lab at UCL, she, where she's professor in evolution and behavior, a Royal Society University Research Fellow and Fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. She's also the author of an excellent recent book on cooperation, The Social Instinct, How Cooperation Shaped the World. So today we uh, normally would start with uh, a, a formal presentation from Moshe and Erez, but honestly, there's plenty of those floating around the internet. So what we thought we'd do is actually kind of dive in with the informal fireside chat. Uh, does that sound good to everybody? All right, so uh, this book is excellent. Uh, it is the result of years of thinking and challenging and integration across disciplines. Um, the way I see it, it's kind of an attempt to rationalize the irrational by bringing in the missing pieces. But Moshe Urez, would you like to kind of give us a, a quick overview of what you were trying to do in this book? Sure. Um, we uh, are interested in why people do the very weird things that they do. Um, why uh, some people grow long pinky nails in rural societies, but when we look at them, uh, we think, wow, that's kind of ugly. Or why um, do uh, some people give, lots of people give to charity, but when they do that, they do it in this weird way where they'll give to charities like Habitat for Humanity that do a nice thing. They build houses, but they do it by flying people all the way across the world to a place where they could probably have used the funds from the flight ticket to build more housing by hiring local people who actually know how to build houses. Um, we look at things like why do people feud? We have these great examples throughout history from Shakespeare and not from Shakespeare, uh, real life as well, of families that will enter into decades long feuds that will decimate the family. Think about the Hatfields and McCoys of the United States, for instance, where they seem driven to avenge wrong in a way that when you look at this from an outside, and this is perhaps what makes Shakespeare uh, so enthralling when it comes to this, you think, oh my God, don't do that, don't do that. We know how this is going to work out, and yet they can't help themselves. They have to do it. So, so we're asking questions um, about uh, about like these. Why are people so weird? And we're trying to use game theory to come up with those answers. Do you have anything to add to that, Moshe? Um, no, no. I, I think that's a, a great list of some of the puzzles we address. We we really do like um, uh, focusing on puzzles, things that things that people otherwise would think are kind of weird and irrational or very across cultures and we don't quite know why. Um, and as Eric has said, uh, we tend to use game theory to, to explain those things. And, and maybe I'll just add, we use it with, a, with kind of a, a cultural evolutionary twist. Um, so we often interpret the games, uh, and this is maybe the part that's most unique about the book, we interpret the games uh, game theory usually kind of assumes that people are, are optimizing and, and, and rational in some kind of conscious sense. But, but actually the math doesn't require that. The math just requires some notion of optimization. And, and we think other processes like um, cultural evolution often do the optimization for us. And um, that, that's, that's maybe another unique point that I wanted to highlight. So, so just, just quickly, I just kind of kind of wind this back a little bit. Lots of disciplines are trying to understand human behavior, psychologists have answers, cultural evolutionary people, behavioral scientists, whatever. Um, what what is game theory? Uh, what is this like? How is this abstract math helping me at all to understand things that I actually give a shit about, could care about? Both of those things. Um, <laughs> game theory is, is a mathematical toolkit uh, designed to understand strategic in interactions. But let me make that concrete. Um, a game has really just three parts. There are some players. They can choose between different actions, and um, they will get payoffs. To make this game theory, there's just two more things that we need. One is 
those payoffs, they are going to depend not just on what I do, but also what other people are, are doing, what the other players are doing. And, and fundamentally, this is what game theory is about. It's, it's about those strategic interactions where I, I need to know what others are going to do in order to choose what I'm going to do, but they need to know what I'm going to do in order to choose what they're going to do. And that's the problem we're going to be trying to solve here. And then the other thing is the thing that Mo just mentioned is game theory assumes that when they make that decision, they're doing it in some way that's, that's somewhat optimized. Exactly how they do the optimization that game theory is not specifying that. And as Mo is alluding to, we're going to rely on a certain kind of optimization that maybe people don't focus on as much traditionally for game theory. Most of the time people are thinking about things like, you know, executives who are in the boardroom thinking really hard with lots of good data or like statesmen strategizing over what to do in Ukraine or things like that. And we're thinking about a very different kind of optimization when, when we're tackling the kind of questions that we tackle. Gotcha. Just just very quickly for the audience, um, I want to set the stage here, just make sure that everyone's on the same page, understands uh, what's going on. But there's almost 300 of you or around 300 people here. If you've got questions, just drop them in the in the Q&A, vote on other people's questions, and we'll try to integrate it as we go and then fully open it up to the audience. Um, I, I'm still I'm still naively confused, or at least playing the naively confused person. What, what are these payoffs? Like, what are people... What are people, is it this happiness? Is it money? Like, what are we trying to optimize in these games as you see them? Um, wow, that's a loaded question, which I think you know, and that's why you asked. Um, so in, in our case, we're gonna focus on a set of payoffs that um, uh, drive the learning process. Let me try to make that concrete. So um, if, if you're asking the question, why do some people find certain things beautiful? Or uh, why does it feel good to get vengeance or to give to a charity? You don't want to focus on the payoff of actually feeling good in that case, or like, you know, getting that exhilaration of uh, getting vindication or, you know, the, the, the good feeling from looking at something beautiful, because that's kind of not answering the question that we're asking exactly where did that psychological payoff come from? So instead, we're going to have to back out and, and think about a different set of uh, payoffs that are shaping those beliefs and tastes in the first place. Um, a, a way to think about this is a little bit like the way that animal uh, trainers think. An animal trainer will um, train an animal to like doing certain things, like they like doing certain tricks. But um, where does that liking come from? Well, the animal trainer carefully associated it with getting treats and, and getting belly rubs and things like that, so that eventually the animal likes it in and of itself, but it's because of this association with something else. The food, the treats, the belly rubs, those are things um, that we would normally call primary rewards. There's something that most animals or all animals really like and that guide the kinds of things animals will learn to like in addition to that. The, the things like learning to do a flip and liking that flip, we would call that a secondary reward. And then to bring that back to humans, things like I like long pinky nails or I like giving to charity or things like that, we would call that a secondary reward. And we're going to um, uh, ask, but which primary rewards shape that in the first place? Right. Okay. That makes sense. Nicola, do you want to jump in at all? Tiffany? I actually thought it might be quite interesting to ask you a little bit about the game theory and strategic interaction of writing a co-authored book and you know what basically what how you chose to write the book together and what that process entailed and how you actually went about doing that i'd like to know that too man you gotta go back a long time i'm gonna let mo start on this one because the story really begins with mo a teenager and he's got um, long payas and a black hat, and he's, he's growing up orthodox. And um, I'll let him take it from here, and he'll explain where, where it went from here. I'll also just say that, um, uh, you know, we assume that on average, in the long run, people end up optimizing. But, but that doesn't necessarily, because of, you know, social learning and, and individual learning process, it doesn't necessarily mean the first occurrence is uh, people have an optimal. So, so watch and see if we write a second book together. <laughs> um, but I at least enjoyed the process and, and couldn't have done it on my own. And what Eris is alluding to is that um, at a very young age, I kind of had the basic goal of, of something like this book. So I was uh, um, 
I guess, reading Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene back in high school. And he really sold game theory to me and I guess many of his readers that it, it helps explain so much of animal behavior. Things like uh, sex ratios, why animals often have 50-50 ratio of males to males across, uh, males to females across species, why animals are territorial. They, they can defend territories aggressively just because they arrive first, even if they aren't necessarily the bigger or the stronger uh, animal, why peacocks have long tails. Th these are kind of fundamental puzzles that biologists had a really hard time with before game theory was incorporated. And, and Dawkins in his, his classic uh, book, The Selfish Gene, really explains the rudimentary ideas of game theory and, and shows just how much it could explain. And so, so to us, it was kind of the gold standard. And to me in high school, it was just like eye-opening. Wow, you can explain so much with these very simple uh, mathematical insights. And I, I guess already then I was thinking, well, that's animal behavior. What can it teach us about you know, our weird beliefs? And you know, as Ares alluded to, uh, I grew up in a weird belief system, but uh, I mean, no offense to everybody else on this call, so, so did all of you. Mine happened to be Orthodox Judaism, but everybody's culture has their odd beliefs and their odd behaviors. And, um, you know, after having left uh, uh, the religion, you know, I, like many other people, were puzzling over how could I believe such strange things and how could so many people act so in such a funny way, we all do this, where is it coming from? Maybe game theory, just like it can explain all this stuff and animals can, can do so something similar in humans. So I, I went off to college, tried to learn game theory. I ended up blah, blah, blah. I can tell you more of my story, but, but let me fast forward a little bit to like the first time I tried to like incorporate game theory to explaining social behavior uh, without errors as help. I got like by far the worst evals imaginable and all the students were complaining like, what does this have to do with like classical economics? This isn't what I signed up for. Like, this is so disorganized, like nothing is well explained. Anyhow, I told this to errors and he was like, okay, I, I really love your content. Let's do this right. Um, and he moved to Boston and, and we designed this course at, at MIT and, and um, you know, eventually led to this book. But I, I think the basic, you know, to get past us to the more general question, I think what this really gets at is this econ concept of comparative advantage, um, which is um, different people have different strengths and weaknesses. Mine are, are, are not on the organizational side or, or, or even the writing side or, or speaking side, as you might be learning right now. Um, uh, Ares has a lot of these talents. and. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, maybe hopefully he can see similar talents in me, but I, I think, you know, with co-authors, with collaborators, it's always good to, to look for people who are really good at the things that you're not really good at. Um, and uh, especially, you know, to, to put those together in, in a coherent whole. And I think uh, we did that and it, it worked out very well for us. And I guess I would recommend the same for other collaborators. And, and let me just tie it back to the thesis of the book. We talk a lot in, uh, in the last chapter about passions and how passions develop. And we use this concept of primary rewards that Ares alluded to, the, the key notion of incentives that we think uh, uh, cultural evolution and learning processes tend to, to optimize and what, the way game theory ought to be interpreted in these contexts. Well, the passions that we develop, we argue, correspond with the things that, that fit our competitive advantage. Um, and, and um, I, you know, I think, I, I, I think it, human beings are very good at finding what they're good at and, and suddenly learning, learning how to do that well and, and enjoy it. And well, I really in, enjoyed working on this book and I really enjoyed the collaboration. Uh, uh, it, it, yeah. All right. Nicola, did you have any other uh, questions? No, I mean, that. well, I have other questions, but that's the uh, question about the, why you, um, you know, I thought it would be interesting to know more about having written a book. It's a bit opaque to me how you would, you know, go about doing that with another person and the kinds of strategic conflicts that might arise in that uh, otherwise cooperative endeavor, I think are quite interesting to find out more about. Um, I, I will say it's, it's rather interesting that Nicola wrote a book, uh, The Social Instinct on cooperation by herself, and Moshe and Erez wrote a book on strategic game theory uh, together. Um, so, I, 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 you know, I, I keep thinking a lot of people you mentioned earlier, you know, kids, uh, the students coming into your class kind of had this classical economic model in their mind. And they're like, how, what is this game theory thing? You're not, you're not answering any of the questions the way I expect you to. The, you know, the people in the audience, I imagine, have this kind of homo economicus, rational animal. That's wrong. Behavioral scientists told us so. We've got heuristics and biases. Are you walking a middle ground? I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the big contribution here? Because it does seem quite revolutionary to me. The way I think of it is a little bit less steeped in this debate, um, which may be not the, the best way to rile people up in response to your question. But 
Um, usually when we, when we start our class, we start with puzzles like the ones that um, I referenced earlier. We'll put up you know, pictures of uh, the Struma, which is a refugee boat that um, the, the Brits and Ottomans kind of towed to sea and, and let sink with hundreds of people on it. And we'll, we'll talk about um, the contrast between uh, someone like uh, Martin Luther and Henry VIII, who both founded um, religions and, and, and things like that. And, and so we don't even enter into the debate about rationality or irrationality. We literally just bomb them with puzzles and uh, get them to realize the domain of questions we're going to tackle and get them to recognize that this domain of questions might be a little different from how am I going to set prices today? Or you know, am I going to open a new plant in uh, you know, the Western United States in order to refine oil? Um, and when we do that, uh, I think that that sort of gets folks to realize, I, I understand this is going to use some math. I saw that in the reviews. I don't really yet see the connection between how the math is going to be relevant for these questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, buy it. And then we have to do a little bit of work at the beginning of the class to, to convince them that uh, game theory really is relevant to these kinds of questions. So that's how I tend to think of it. But you're right that there is a debate right now. Well, it's not just now, it's been a few decades around this question of like, to what extent are these econ tools relevant? And uh, we are, somewhat uh, walk in the middle ground in that we're using hardcore um, econ tools, but we're using them for these questions where people seem to be acting irrationally and we're using them in these contexts where it's like not even obvious people all should be thinking about economic tools. Like, where does your sense of aesthetics come from? Oh, I, mean, I don't know. Like, how, how, come, how come game theory applies to that? I didn't think about that carefully in a boardroom with a bunch of other people. But, but as uh, has come up now a few times, all game theory requires is that you have some optimization going on. And as long as you recognize just how powerful our, our you know, cultural evolution, biological evolution are, it's perfectly legitimate to use game theory in these contexts. And it just seems like maybe that's been not done as much as one might expect. And so what we did was found a niche where we thought we could add by, by doing more of that. Okay. Mike, let me, let me just add, um, if you don't mind, yeah, no, please. I, I think I think the key thing that um, uh, the key way that, that I at least think about the, this rationality debate is that there's a lot of things that it's easy to see as irrational until you think about where our beliefs and preferences are, are, are coming from and the underlying logic that might be shaping that. And in in some cases, the behavioral approach, which is you know just things like. Uh, you know, we have limited cognitive abilities. And so we use heuristics and that leads to biases. That kind of approach in some cases will give a pretty good answer. But in other cases, I, I think it's gonna make a lot more sense to think about how these preferences were learned. And in that case, uh, they will in some sense end up being rational. They will in some sense be optimizing something, something like what we talked about before primary rewards or, or, or if it's biologically evolved, it'll optimize something like, like biological fitness. And so, so in, in many contexts, things will just kind of look behavioral and look irrational. But if you, if you look a little bit deeper to where those preferences and beliefs are coming from and the, the learning or evolution processes that shape it, there will be an underlying rationality at play. And maybe I'll just add one or two minor points. Um, and and we, we talk about this at length in like the intro chapters in our book, but one or two minor points is when things are, are, are learned or evolved, you do get things um, like uh, spillover effects and, and lag effects, which um, uh, uh, again, we give many examples of, but just to kind of list a few, uh, you know, people in the cultural evolutionary literature have documented the fact that like our taste for spices, for instance, um, culturally evolved to help combat um, foodborne pathogens. And so it's gonna be more likely in cultures like uh, in cuisines like Indian cuisine, where, where they have a specific climate that, that makes the food more at risk of these kind of pathogens. Um, um, and, and so that's kind of a functional underlying rationality story for, for our taste for spiciness, or at least Indian people's taste for spiciness. But of course, in, in the US, there are many Indian people, and I, I guess in, in England or many other places where they've moved to since, and many um, uh, uh, people from Indian cultures and families, heritages, still end up liking Indian food even a generation, two generations later. And that's an example to us of, of, of kind of a lag effect. Like there was an underlying logic to where this cuisine developed the spiciness to begin with, but but of course nowadays, you know, if you're living in England or the U.S., uh, the, it no longer is serving necessarily that same function. You know, you have even refrigeration, which uh, so the meats aren't getting bad when they're not spiced, but the taste still persists. 
Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, that's maybe another wrinkle on this rationality debate is that there's a lot of evidence of things like, like persistence or, or spilling over from one context where, where the thing initially evolved to another context that, that's also important to keep in mind. Learning and evolution and processes are not perfect in every instance. Uh, they're perfect kind of on average in the long run. Um, and, and so, you know, even the, the rationality stories we might tell also have some irrational um, uh, wrinkle to it. Makes sense. N Nicola, feel free to jump in at any point, but otherwise I'm going to take, there's a uh, question here that's racking up a few votes. So this is from Kristen, one of our uh, LSE alum. Um, and she asks, you know, how does the optimization assumption in game theory reconcile or align with looking at behavior that is seemingly irrational, which is often a term to characterize behavior where people are not optimizing their benefit? And I think, I think you kind of answered that just now, but maybe uh, could you take an example from your book that you... Uh, can show the insight that a game theory approach would would offer and then contrast it with, let's say, a traditional uh, behavioral economics or a traditional psychological approach. Which one should we do, Mo? Maybe altruism? Altruism is good. And we can also just tie back into, you know, the spice example that I just gave, for instance. Okay, you do that and then I, I'll do the, the effective altruism uh, right. one. Great. Well, I mean, just the spice example, which actually is one that, that doesn't require game theory. That's just kind of a classic, like, you know, there's, it's just, uh, there's a simple functional story that people aren't consciously aware of. Uh, we might develop a taste for spicy cuisines because uh, to combat foodborne pathogens. Don't need game theory for that, but it kind of illustrates that cultural evolution has this ability to optimize without people's conscious awareness. I, I alluded to passions also. That's another example we discussed in the book where, where people kind of develop uh, um, this desire to, to do things that they're comparatively good at um, and that's rewarded in their society. We also talk about that. Those are two examples that don't require game theory, but, but exhibit this underlying logic. And just to, to address this question, you, you know, why is um, uh, why is it why why is the approach of thinking through the underlying rationality logic function useful in these cases? And errors will get to altruism in a sec. Well, it, it's useful because in, in a pure behavioral story, you might say something like, "Well, people, uh, the reason why uh, people in India eat spicy cuisines is because they have a taste for spiciness." And you know, that, that's such a that's so much of a silly answer that nobody would even you know, uh, it's so self-evidently silly that, that I guess there aren't papers written like that. Um, but in behavioral economics, as Ayers will get to with, with altruism, you do have the analog going on where people do say, you know, why do people give to ineffective charities? The answer will be, well, because we kind of like giving, it feels good to give, and, and that feeling of goodness doesn't really depend on how effective it is. So, so there, the, 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 that's the warm glow story. The story of like, oh, it's just what our preferences are, is, is somewhat actually uh, um, uh, appealing to people, and, and but it's almost as silly as, as in this um, cuisine case. Um, and likewise with passions, you know, uh, we have a story about competitive advantage and what's rewarded in society, and we talk through the evidence for that and stuff, but I think that that really fits a lot of the psychology that's going on with passions and a lot of the, the um, specific uh, instances and examples that we go through in the book. But, you know, if you just think about like, passions from a, 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 what we would call approximate perspective of just like what people prefer, uh, you know, you kind of like, you lose all those insights and it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes almost a trivial answer of, oh, people, the reason why Bobby Fischer was so obsessed with chess was he was just like, he had this preference and like, you don't really get that much mileage out of it. You can't really explain why some people are into chess only in some places, only in some times, why people are willing to sacrifice and become super obsessed. You, you don't get too much bite out of that. And, and so, so I think, I think you're missing out a lot. And maybe, um, well, Eros will give a concrete example about uh, that uses game theory, but the book is kind of full, full of them. And the book, kind of the proof is in the pudding. We, we do think we explained a lot of puzzles that the behavioral approach just really doesn't get that far with. And you give, if you give these proximate answers in terms of preferences, you really, or in terms of, well, people are just irrational, you, you don't get that far. And, uh, and we think that's why people haven't gotten that far in explaining things like our, our passions and, and, and our tastes without thinking about the, this kind of functional perspective. So, just, um, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Nicola. Right, so um, my colleague, Dave Lagnardo, has asked a pet question that I think is quite interesting. And I'll follow up with a bit of a, a follow on question for us. So his question is, are there cases of social interactions where game theory tools seem inadequate and where, you know, we, they, we, they don't really have the explanatory power that um, that they need to be able to uh, help us understand them? And I guess linked to that, um, I would be interested to know whether you think what you think the kind of um, gaps in our understanding are with respect to game theory and where you see sort of like open areas for 
you know, what don't we know yet? And where do we, where will this field go? Eris, you want to? This one is, I think, uh, Mo is the guy who sees all the gaps. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I have low enough self-esteem that I'm always questioning myself, as I think what Eris is trying to. <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, I, 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 we should think more about this. This is every scientist, I guess, should think more about, uh, you know, the extent uh, 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 of their tools. Uh, utility, how far they can take it and, and, and what the limitations are. And, and so I'm glad you guys are prodding us on, on this. Um, I think one limitation is obviously, as I mentioned, especially if the game theory is only working so well because of learning and evolutionary processes, those are relatively slow processes that have lags and spillovers and, and, and you know, they do take time and they only work on average. And so these kind of insights, the approach presented in the book is going to work less well when you don't have that kind of time to adjust and the ability to, to learn. Um, so, you know, in one-off uh, experiments where, where we're in kind of these very novel abstracted situations, uh, um, you know, we don't think people are gonna be that optimal in those cases. And, you know, to have a game theory model that's tailor made to that particular experiment, I, I, I don't think that's such a great idea. I, I, might, I might still use those experiments to kind of tap into an evolved psychology or a psychology that's, that's been you know, culturally learned. So you could still learn a lot about uh, the details of our psychology, which maybe then you can, can use game theory to explain. But to build a game theory model to explain a one-off situation that, 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 that's novel, I, I think that's one of the places where it's not gonna work as well. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, so that's one limitation, novel one-off situations it doesn't, doesn't really help us that much with. Maybe one other limitation is because it's relying on these kind of uh, slow, on average uh, um, uh, learning and evolutionary processes, those, and it relies on our ability as scientists to model these situations. Um, well, we kind of need to recognize, uh, you know, be a little bit humble about how good we are at modeling it and how, how exactly how optimal those processes are going to be. And one, one place where we try to employ humility is we try to only make predictions that, that are what we call, uh, it's an econ term, comparative static predictions, which is, you know, I guess in a nutshell, comparative static just means like, uh, qualitative predictions. So uh, we don't we, we don't trust ourselves enough. We don't trust both the optimization processes and our ability as modelers enough to like get exact you know mathematical precision on being able to predict things. We expect kind of to be able to make directional predictions. So I don't know if if our sense of altruism is being shaped by reputational benefits. Well, that'll be sensitive to like whether you know others are more or less likely to learn about what you do or think it's good what you're doing and on you know but that's kind of a directional prediction it's not like oh you're going to give exactly 0.27 percent of your income to charity because that'll lift your reputation by 27 point like like i mean i would never trust a, a, um at least in the social sciences anybody to make such pr precise predictions and, and we try we try just to stick to comparative statics maybe maybe a third limitation and then then i'll, then I'll shut up um is uh um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things about, um, well, okay, no, I'll stop there because I've been talking enough, but we can talk more afterwards. I, I love the question. Um, I, I have a kind of follow-on question from that, actually, which is um, maybe a bit harsh, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> it's, and it's basically whether that could, have, could kind of like the worst critic of game theory argue that it's basically a tool for explaining things that you've already observed and it's not it's not really a tool for helping you to predict things that haven't that you don't know about yet. Yeah. E, e do you want to uh, try to run into this landmine, or do you want me to to take the bullet again? <laughs> I'll I'll uh, give an example where I think that somewhat addresses this. I think it's a fair criticism, first of all, and I would say that that the primary use of game theory in the book is to try to understand the world, the things that we already observe. And let it's less about uh, trying to predict the future. Although we are to some extent, like anybody who's doing a scientific endeavor, one of the things that demonstrates the value of the scientific endeavor is that you are able to come up with predictions, not necessarily of the future, but of things that people maybe didn't think to test that, that um, you're now able to test. Um, think about uh, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. There were certain things people didn't think of testing about like the, the speed of light. I don't remember the details of the experiments, but uh, about the speed of light that only you know, generations later were we able to test that. That's part of what made it so compelling. So in an ideal world, you do come up with those. 
Um, but I will give you one concrete example that I think illustrates the fact that game theory does have some predictive power um, and is somewhat surprising. So if you look at um, a very classic uh, game theory model, the costly signal model, it's the one that we alluded to earlier that's able to explain um, uh, long tails and birds. And it explains things like uh, why people uh, grow those long pink, uh, pinky nails that we also referenced and why people like fancy cars and things like that. Um, it's, it's a very, um, it's now a fairly old model dating back to the uh, early 1980s. There was a Nobel prize in economics um, uh, associated with it and so on. You can ask what that model will do, what it can do is it can tell you when are costly signals uh, um, a Nash equilibrium, when it, does it make sense for, for people to be sending these expensive costly signals, to be growing those long tails, to be, to be um, uh, paying for those expensive cars, and when does it not make so much sense. And you actually see in practice this dynamic of like costly signal is arising and then uh, falling away. Uh, for instance, in the medieval period, People think of medieval cuisine as being, there's no spice, you just throw stuff on the fire. But actually, the evidence that we has, have suggests quite to the contrary, medieval cuisine was quite spicy. The closest we have in terms of modern cuisines uh, to uh, medieval cuisines is probably Moroccan food. I think it's got a fair amount of spice, a fair amount of sugar in it. And that's, um, uh, you know, these stews and things like that. That's, that's what we think was very popular at the time based on our review of uh, uh, old cookbooks over the course of many centuries. At a certain point, this cuisine falls out of fashion. It goes away. And it's a little bit hard to understand, like where did, why did it arise in the first place? Why, you know, Europe doesn't really have a need to say preserve meat the way that Mo was referring to earlier. So why would it bother with, uh, with this uh, use of spice in the first place? And then why would it go away? And this, the cost of signaling explanation for this is spices and sugar were expensive at the time. So if, um, if you could afford it, you would um, uh, uh, use these costly signals. People uh, developed a liking for costly signals, but really what this was was an underlying uh, way of, of separating out folks who could afford this, this difficult to afford thing and folks who couldn't. Uh, a similar story to the one that's given for say peacock scales, only the fit peacocks can grow the really long tails. So that's, that's the story here. The prediction is that as the cost, somewhat ironically, right? Right? especially you know, in economics, usually when prices go down, people buy more of the stuff. Here, the prediction is actually, as prices go down, the value of this thing as a signal will go down and people will stop using it. And that's exactly what we see. We see the, the, the use of uh, sugar and spices collapsing at the same time that international trade is bringing the costs of these things down in the uh, 15th, uh, really 16th, 17th century. Um, and there's a similar story with like white shirts and uh, blue shirts where this hasn't happened yet, but I've got a prediction. So I'm gonna make the prediction and we can talk in like 30 years and you can tell me if I was right. Where traditionally there's a, a big distinction between blue collar workers and white collar workers where blue collar workers, they wear blue, they wear indigo in particular, which has all of these uh, characteristics where it makes it hard to see stains. It makes it hard for the stains to set. Um, in the first place and contrast that with a white shirt where any stain will show. And during the Tudor period, uh, white shirts became increasingly popular. Basically what happened was traditionally people wore their, their um, jackets like this and gradually people wanted to show off that their, their whites underneath, their undergarments were actually clean. And so they would bring out their cuffs, they would cut a slit in the jacket and tuft out their shirt. And eventually the, the very fancy frilly collars developed and so on and so forth. And today's jacket with the open chest is the evolved version of that. And the whole idea was to show off the white shirt underneath. And that's why the white shirt is this classic men's formal wear staple. And, um, and all it's doing is it's showing off that you know, you're not a worker that you can keep your cups clean, you can keep your collar clean, you can actually afford to wash your garments uh, uh, often enough, which is something that blue collar folks couldn't do, so it separated you from those folks. But today we all have office jobs where we can keep white shirts clean. And so the, the function of that shirt is going away. So much like the benefit of showing off with sugar and spices went away and, and then our taste for it went away, my expectation is that this fashion will actually change. There's some hints of that if you walk around um, you know, bank, uh, you see a lot of color now. You don't see a ton of white shirts anymore. And so there's some evidence that the fashion is changing in that direction. Um, and we'll see if I'm right. So, so there you go. I've, I've put my uh, uh, stake in the ground. So I'm conscious that I want to make sure we uh, have the audience answer, have some of their questions answered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss you a few that are kind of ranked up here. 
Uh, Dr. Richard Steele of NTU, senior lecturer in psychology, says uh, game theory seems surprisingly absent from psychology, which is interesting too. Uh, despite its potential to predict behavior, what are some of your favorite applications of game theory to psychology? And Dylan, a year 12 student, says, uh, what is the term hidden games defined as uh, in, in your interpretation within the book? You want me to? Oh, you're muted, but I think you're saying it's okay if I go. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, so, so uh, maybe first I'll just really quickly answer the hidden games question, uh, and then I'll come back to the other one. Uh, um, so uh, hidden games, we just think that's whenever game theory is being applied at, at a non-conscious level to explain where our beliefs and preferences are coming from. So, so uh, thanks for asking. Hope that clarifies. But you know, anytime cultural evolution, learning processes, even biological evolution are shaping our beliefs and preferences to be consistent with the logic of game theory, be consistent with things like Nash equilibria. Um, uh, that's when it's a, a hidden game. Less hidden when we're talking about like, you know, CEOs in a boardroom, you know, trying to decide what's the optimal way to price their product. They might be responding to game theory logic, but in a very conscious deliberative sense, then the game isn't so hidden. Um, okay, so, so that's what we mean by hidden games. Um, how, how do hidden games apply to psychology? What are some of our best cases? Well, we actually think a lot of the um, uh, social psychology literature um, is really, really good at documenting interesting puzzles, um, things like cognitive dissonance, um, uh, which is this idea that like, if you're, if, you, if you're kind of pressured or incentivized to do something, um, you might end up adjusting your beliefs to, to be aligned with that thing that you did. Um, otherwise, an approximate explanation for that would be, well, it feels dissonant if your beliefs and behavior are inconsistent. So that's a really good example of something that psychologists have, have in our opinion, really well documented. Um, some very nice classic experiments really show this, but it kind of still raises the question of like, where does uh, dissonance come from? When are you gonna feel dissonant? Um, how exactly does distance work, why would we ever develop or you know, evolve a brain that like has this feeling and responds to it? And, and we think something like that, uh, the hidden uh, games approach might help with. So it might say something like, well, if, if, if you're worried about your reputation in front of others, about, about seeming like you're, you're principled, uh, that might suggest that like, you don't want other people to think that you just are willing to, you know, lie for a buck and like, you know, in the classic experiments, you're paid to give a speech about like how great communism is. And like, you know, people say it, and then afterwards they, they kind of start to believe it. That's the classic demonstration of cognitive dissonance. But like, okay, if you don't adjust your beliefs and you just say, well, I gave that speech because I'm willing to lie for a buck. You don't look that trustworthy. You don't look that principled. And so we think this, the sense of dissonance might track like how important it is to like adjust your beliefs to be, consistent with your behavior, at least if needed to maintain a reputation for being a, a good trustworthy principled person. So, so we can use this idea of game theory to understand how reputations work, to understand how trust works, uh, and to maybe give us a better sense of when you might feel dissonant. So that's, that's kind of one application, but we talk a lot about motivated reasoning too. So why our beliefs might end up being biased. And, you know, again, social psychologists have documented many interesting uh, um, phenomena where our beliefs end up being biased and like, strange ways. So for instance, if you get supportive evidence for something you want to be true, you're going to incorporate that into your beliefs and, and lift your beliefs up and that can lead you to be overconfident. If you get non-supportive evidence, you'll ignore it. But there's this weird, weird asymmetry going on where you're able to ignore bad evidence, but you can't make up the good evidence. So you're responding only when you find it. That asymmetry is, is like documented in the literature, but again, not well explained. It's just like, well, that's kind of how we're able to lie to ourselves. But again, you can ask, why does our mind allow ourselves to, to lie in this particular way? How does, you know, can we better understand how motivated reasoning works? And, and okay, so, so again, we have a chapter on this where we say, well, if motivated reasoning is about persuading other people, but, you, you know, so, so you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be distorting information, you know, sharing it in a propagandistic way, but you also like, don't want to get caught lying. You don't want to get punished for saying something that, that, that's an overt lie, but it's a lot harder to get caught lying by omission, a lot harder to get punished lying by omission. We'll be more, more willing to lie by omission than by commission. And our beliefs, if our beliefs are there to help us persuade others, they'll also show that same fundamental asymmetry. So that's another example of classic social psych phenomena, motivated reasoning that we think the hidden game can, can help you understand. And as Eris mentioned, we keep alluding to altruism as a third. I won't go into that, but, but we, we talk a lot. Uh, I guess Nicola also, of course, her, her whole book is on this. There's a lot of really good work on altruism and how thinking about the underlying game theory can help us understand that phenomenon, which is something that social psychologists might give a more approximate explanation for, oh, it's how empathy and compassion works, uh, um, how one glow works. But like, again, if you think about the, the underlying uh, game, how reputations work, how signaling work, you, you might get a, a deeper grasp of how altruism works. 
Guys, there's two questions in the chat that I think are like pretty similar to each other and maybe you might want to, um, we should pose them to you. So they both center around this idea that if people only knew the payoffs or if people do know the payoffs associated with the various different options they could pursue, why do they pick the wrong thing? Like, why do they pick the thing that results in a lower payoff? So the two questions are, why do intelligent people adopt a poor diet and become obese? This behavior is causing an obesity crisis around the world. Why is this happening? And the related question I think is basically more or less the same thing is, why do experts not apply the core of their specialization to their own lives? For example, why would doctors do things that are harmful to their own health and things like that? So I think they both, in a way, they're driving at the same thing, which is like, if you know what the payoff is, why don't you do the thing that gets the good payoff? You got a good one, a good response, Bill? I mean, I, I can start, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think, I, I think part, of, part of our answer might come back to, um, uh, um, uh, the the uh, lag and spillover story that I gave earlier, which is we're, we're not going to be perfect in every situation, especially situations that we haven't learned or evolved to deal well with. And I think, um, uh, you know, uh, since the argument is really relying on learning processes, getting things right, um, that requires that it's the kind of thing that like you have a lot of experience with or, or that you can adjust for, at least when we're relying on learning. Um, and, and some things we think adjust much quicker and require a lot less experience for than, than others. Um, and, and so those things we think are gonna be much more responsive to like your contemporary environment and your incentives. So, so morality is one such thing. We really do think our morals are so rapidly changing and we get so much experience like seeing other people uh, um, norm enforcing or, or, or having to make moral judgments and getting punished for them and, and, or, or getting you know told like, like the, that's the right thing to do or the right thing to say. We get a lot of feedback on our morality and it looks like our morality is very fungible that, that like what we think is morally right or wrong really adjusts based on culture and based on your own life experience. And, and you can see very rapid changes and very big differences across cultures. Some other things it, it, we really don't seem to be that, that good at learning from. And maybe that's because the more hardwired and like it's kind of there's less free parameters in our in our learning processes and it's more just like evolutionarily fixed what your tastes are um, like so, salt fat sugar the taste yeah, of salt, fat, that's sugar. right that's, that's right. right that's right that's where i was going um uh, 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 that that's something that like i mean Eris mentioned like okay it's true that like for some cuisines like whether you put make them su the meat super sweet that could change because there's a cost of signaling dynamic but like that's not going to override the fact that like we've evolved to like sugars and like that's just that's something that like is so strongly ingrained that like i mean yes we can like you know you can learn to like more refined belgium chocolates that are uh, you know aren't you know you can learn to like some things but like the overall liking for sugar that's really really hard to overcome and and you know just biological evolution for good reason like wanted to wanted to build that in very very hard and make it very very insensitive to life experience that it, it's kind of uh, yeah that makes sense and then um, maybe I'll just mention that you know the third thing I was going to answer to to Dave's original question of what's the limitations of game theory um, I think one one other limitation which maybe is showing up here is you know some questions like uh, acrasia like uh, self control problems I I really don't think. Our, our models are, are the best for. I think that really requires understanding how the different, um, you know, brain systems like system one and system two interact. How like conscious deliberative processes like can can control the more uh, um, uh, uh, model free based learning processes and the more intuitive like that kind of interaction. I think really requires a deep understanding of how the cognitive uh, psychology works, the cognitive science, uh, and, and less about like the underlying incentive structure. So so I think to understand people's morality underlying incentive structure, hidden games, cultural evolution are gonna help a lot. To understand things like self-control, I'm guessing that there's something else interesting going on there that, that our tools just aren't, aren't, aren't the best for. You, you really kind of need to know more about the cognitive science involved. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a few questions on kind of what can I do with this stuff? So uh, for example, Maria, uh, an LSE behavioral science MSC students asks, uh, climate crisis, how do we boost towards sustainability uh, what's the upside of knowing that people's irrational behavior is is somewhat rational? Uh, what can I do with this? Yeah, that's my day job. Um, so, um, you know, Mo and I work together on this more theoretical agenda, but then uh, 
my my goal uh, in in the other part of my job is to try to make this useful and uh, think in particular about how one promotes prosocial behaviors, um, behaviors like sustainability. So at the highest level, basically what we're doing is by looking at the game theory, you can understand the environment in which cooperation and prosociality flourishes. Um, and it takes a little bit of work because the game theory will tell you things like first order beliefs are important, higher order beliefs are important, and there are multiple equilibria, which if you just tell people, they'll be like, okay, that was a bunch of jargon. Now, what does that actually mean? So you have to translate that jargon into something useful. But um, there was a, I just want to quickly jump in because there was a question about multiple equilibria and how you distinguish that from irrational behavior. So if you want to throw that in while you're answering. Uh, yes. Um, let me let me put a pin in it. I'll come back to that one. Um, so so you have you know you have these predictions um, uh, about what will enable cooperation, what will make the environment uh, um, fertile for cooperation. But you, you have to do a little bit of translating in order to um, make that something that somebody can use. And so we we've done we've put some effort into that. And and fundamentally, um, the three things I just mentioned actually do correspond to something that the average person can understand fairly quickly. You need to increase the observability of of the um, desirable action, uh, make it so that other people find out about it so they can get a reputational boost. And Moshe referenced the fact that a lot of our altruistic behavior at a, at a non-conscious level is being driven by these reputational concerns. So you need to give reputations a chance to work. That's that first order beliefs part. Um, there needs to be a, um, a sort of conscious effort to eliminate uh, plausible excuses. We're really good at taking advantage of excuses not to give. There's this great study that illustrates this um, where uh, people teamed up with the Salvation Army and they randomized whether they stood in front of one door of a supermarket or both doors of a supermarket while um, uh, asking for donations around Christmas time. And when they stand in front of just one door of the supermarket, people go out the other door. Um, and so that's a, a, a nice illustration of the fact that people, the same people who would have otherwise given, we know that because we're doing this randomly. So we know that donations actually go up when we stand in front of both doors. Uh, the same people who would have otherwise given are taking advantage of the excuse not to give. Um, those excuses are undermining the ability uh, of reputations to do their work. And that's that thing I said about higher order beliefs uh, mattering. That's what it connects to. So um, the, the other piece of uh, practical advice we give is that, eliminate those plausible excuses. Excuses. And then this thing about multiple equilibria, which we'll come back to on a theoretical level as well, this thing about multiple equilibria um, uh, translates into this idea that uh, in these cooperative environments, there's typically um, sometimes uh, the case that you're expected to do good things and sometimes not. Think about, uh, you guys are in London, so think about uh, escalators. In London, uh, when you ride an escalator, you stand on one side, you let people pass on the other side. I can never remember which side you guys actually stand on. But um, in some places, that's not the case. So Tokyo, London, New York, Boston, you stand on the side to let people pass. That's a cooperative act, right? You're, you're, you know, maybe it would have been more comfortable to talk to your friend by standing side by side, but you're not going to do that so that people can go, can go past uh, as a minor inconvenience for you to benefit another individual, a nice social act. But that's not the case in like Denver. If you show up at the airport in Denver, or if you show up at the airport in California, people are like, chill, bro, why you gotta hurry? You know, I'm just gonna stand here. That's what escalators are for, they move for you. And so like, why would it be the case that, that uh, you know, these, these multiple equilibria basically tell, teach us why it would be the case that in some cases you're expected to do the good, in some cases not. That's what multiple equilibria mean. But it also uh, teaches us that people will be sensitive to cues of whether they're expected to be good, to behave well in, in a particular context. And so what we tell people is, and if in a particular context they are expected to be pro-social, then just communicate that. That will often be very effective. And behavioral scientists come up with lots of clever ways to do that, like telling people lots of other people are doing this and so on and so forth. So that's our, our kind of guidance when it comes to prosociality. Of course, you know, the book is full of other game theory models focusing on other questions, and, and we have more work to do on making that more practical and, and more useful. But um, uh, we've at least done some of the, the groundwork when it comes to prosociality. Um, Michael, should I transition to uh, responding about multiple equilibria? Yeah, if you don't mind, answer some of the more technical questions. Yeah. Um, Briefly, basically, it's true that lots of games have multiple equilibria, um, and some of the time, 
in our models, we will focus on one of the equilibria in particular, which you think has explanatory power. Um, that might be, say, the cooperative equilibria in one of these um, models describing pro-social behavior, a norm enforcement model, or repeated prisoner's dilemma, if you're familiar with them. And um, it's true that all of these models have these multiple equilibria. And what we want to do is basically like double check that we're actually describing uh, behavior, the equilibrium we think is describing behavior, we actually uh, uh, can get to it and things like that. Um, and so some of the time that involves doing things like, and this doesn't show up in the book, but like in our papers, we'll do this. We'll do some evolutionary dynamics to double check that like actually that costly signaling uh, equilibrium or that that cooperative equilibrium can arise in the first place. It, the, the dynamics will actually lead you there and you'll get stuck there for a meaningful amount of time because if you don't, then you don't want to use that equilibrium to describe behaviors that you think are evolved or learned. Um, uh, so that's the kind of legwork that we'll often do. But basically, um, we won't really focus on equilibria that we think aren't relevant. Let me let me jump in and maybe just add add one more point, um, or, or maybe maybe two more points because I, I think they're somewhat interesting. One is one is oftentimes you know game theorists have said, well, in repeated games, anything goes. You can almost get anything to be in equilibria, and. and this this becomes almost a non-explanation because well if anything goes you haven't you can't really explain much with that model, and and we 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 don't really uh, one thing that we ask is well but in all these equilibria is there some common feature that shows up among all of them and and we try to characterize that so so in our chapter on norm enforcement uh, and on on uh, the repeated prisoners dilemma where we're talking about altruism. We say actually all these all the equilibrium. Anytime you sustain cooperation, you're going to have certain features in common. Let's characterize what those features are. And so this is going to be true no matter which equilibrium we're focusing on. So long as there's some cooperation, there's got to be observability. There's got to be some way in which like future behavior is being affected by present behavior. There's got to be some sensitivity to expectations and higher order beliefs. What does that buy us? Can we say anything there? So so that's I think one 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 trick that we try to use a lot. Which I think is missing in the in the classic game theory literature of like anything goes. Um, okay, what one more insight that I think we bring to bear on this uh, this multiple equilibria issue is, well, in settings like coordination games or norm enforcement where there's money equilibria. So an example of that, like it was mentioned, different cultures will have different norms, like whether you stand or walk on the escalator. Uh, um, you know, some places are going to enforce norms against littering. Some places won't. Uh, um, so, some places are going to, you know, make you, some religions might make you wear a head covering. Others might make you wear, uh, you know, uh, behave and act very differently. Every culture enforces different norms. Uh, um, uh, one point that we would make is, well, how do you, how do you, um, are there certain restrictions on what these norms have to be in order for them to be sustainable? And how do you switch between one norm and another? Um, so how do you get rid of norms? How do you, how do you um, start a norm? And we talk a, a little bit about what, you know, that could be translated to this question of how do you switch between equilibria? Um, and we talk a little bit about what's needed for that. And, and again, just to give kind of the, the, the essence of the idea there is um, to switch between equilibria, things need to be common knowledge. So you need a, a very discrete, uh, event that has no plausible deniability that is that is very observable by by everyone that says okay now things are shifting you can't really change norms by just having rumors that kind of spread slowly through the population or by having a continuous change over time you really need a discrete um very overt very explicit um uh, non-deniable event to switch between different norms and, and that kind of relates to the question of what do you need to switch between different equilibria you have an example Masha? coronation mm. So ahead. the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring is a, is a nice one, yeah. So so, uh, Eros, do you want to uh, elaborate? No, you got it. Okay. Um, well, you know, you can ask, yeah, what causes what causes a, a revolution? Um, uh, you know, you might think uh, raising the tax if the British just just um, you know raise the taxes on the American colonies enough, like like they'll rebel. Okay. It turns out, and I'm sure everybody watching this from uh, from England knows this, that's not in fact what happened, even if that's our propaganda, our American propaganda. In fact, like the rebellion started after taxes were reduced, but just one unique type of tax, tax on tea was introduced. And, and in fact, when that tax was introduced, the total tax level was much lower than people in England were paying, much lower than any other colonies were paying, and much lower than the Americans were paying before. Okay, So a continuous increase in taxes is not what caused the revolution. A discrete new type of tax that was made very, very public by things like the Boston Tea Party, 
um, and, and things like Benjamin Franklin's printing press, um, which were able to spew out all this propaganda about how like onerous this like new tax was. Um, and uh, um, okay, so so a discrete event that's highly publicized by, by like a printing press and by like a, a Boston Tea Party, that's what causes revolutions, uh, um, uh, not a, a continuous change in, in, in tax rates. Uh, yeah. So what does this mean for our, you know, I guess there have been some questions about how this, these kinds of insights can help us tackle big, big problems that we're facing and like listening to you speaking just now I'm kind of thinking well, the kinds of problems we're faced with are those sort of drip, 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 continuous change type problems. So how is, is, there, is there a possibility for social tipping points for the aren't uh, normal anymore? And it took a concerted effort from a consortium of industry members, the government, uh, local governments, and so on to change those norms. And, and uh, that involved ad campaigns, billboards, things that make things public, and say basically this, this is something that we're not going to think of as being okay anymore. And that was, was quite successful. Um, in the early 2000s, when you asked people the same questions about surveying, about um, littering, only um, uh, I think it was about 13% went and responded that they had littered in the last year or something like that. So, so the, um, the number had collapsed by about a, a third. So I think we are pretty good at, at changing norms too. Uh, societies change them all the time. Also, we saw a nice example of this in the pandemic. A lot of the focus has been around how we were ineffective at responding to the pandemic, but actually quite to the contrary, we focused on that precisely because we were kind of engaged in norm enforcement. What you saw is very quickly within a few weeks of the start of the pandemic, um, new behaviors were, were required to fight the pandemic and many people very quickly adopted the view that these were the right things to do. Um, and uh, we have like quite nice evidence that this was done in, because of norm enforcement. So that's a bit, an example of norms changing very rapidly. So I think that if we can use some of these insights around common knowledge, we could change norms uh, uh, sufficiently, somewhat rapidly, and at least somewhat mitigate the problem. Of course, we don't. We also want to do things like make companies pay for emissions, uh, which is like one way. Like, we shouldn't just kick the can to consumers and, and like say, oh, this is your responsibility or something like that and, and let them pollute. Uh, but, you know, nor norms to some extent are used for this uh, when really what we should do is tax pollution and stuff. So, so I also think that those are important parts of the solution, obviously. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a wonderful question to bring this chat to a close since we're at time. Uh, thank you so much, Eris. Thank you so much, Moshe. And thank you so much, Nicola, for joining us. Thank you guys for your great questions. Yes, and thank you very much to the audience for their wonderful questions and voting. Thank you. <laughs>